It's good to have you here with us this morning as we come to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we begin our time this morning, if you would stand with me, we're going to sing our, our opening song. As long as the computer back there behaves, we'll be okay. Oh, you're seeing everything up here just fine. Okay. I sing the mighty power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing sea. This morning, morning. Uh, keep in mind uh, tomorrow, Pastor Dan and Tony will be traveling uh, back to Pennsylvania. Uh, if you saw his message last night, everything went well. Uh, yesterday, with the wedding of his grandson, he said the weather was great. And uh, I had talked to him earlier, and he said it was all outside. And I thought, oh boy, but everything went very well. And so I said to him this morning. Now it's time for you to sit and relax. I'm sure he isn't listening to any of that. But uh, keep them in prayer as they will be on the road tomorrow, uh, coming back, uh, because Wednesday night is business meeting and he wants to be back in time to be prepared for that. Tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, Roy and Cheryl Clark need to be at the hospital. As I was talking to Cheryl this morning, I said, do we pray more for Roy or you? Uh, that's an early time to be at the hospital, but uh, Roy is having his left knee replaced uh, tomorrow, so please keep him in prayer. Keep Cheryl in prayer. Um, I said to Cheryl as we were talking this morning, if we petition, will the doctor give you medication you know, to handle Roy? And I know if Roy's watching this, I'm in deep trouble. But uh, we love you, Roy, and we will be praying for you. So please uh, keep these, and also our missionaries, uh, keep in prayer. But in our, in our uh, services coming up next Sunday, uh, Father's Day, and uh, then also the patriotic service and uh, baptism coming up. If you want to be baptized, please make sure... You talk to Pastor Dan very soon and let him know that you are interested uh, in baptism. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this Lord's Day. And Father, we thank you for the beauty we see around us as, as the earth has come alive this spring and we've seen the leaves again appear on the trees and the flowers that have blossomed and bloomed and, and as things are growing. And Lord, again, it's reminding us of new life that we have and the new life we have in Jesus Christ. And Father, as we gather this morning, Lord, we want to remember our dear pastor and his wife, Tony, in our prayers. Uh, Lord, we just are grateful that they've had a good time out there with uh, their family. But now, Lord, tomorrow as they will be packing up to return to Pennsylvania, Lord, we just pray for safety on the highway for them. Uh, Lord, that you would just put a hedge of protection around them as they drive back uh, home and uh, Lord, prepare for next Sunday, Lord, not only Father's Day, but we also know that they will be having a wedding in their own backyard on Father's Day. And so, Father, we just pray as they come home and get back into the swing of things that, Lord, you continue to give them the strength uh, to do what you've called him to do. And, Father, we just pray for Roy and Cheryl as they uh, venture to the hospital tomorrow morning and pray for Roy as he has this knee replaced. Lord, guide the hands of the surgical team that will be working on him. And Lord, we just pray for a successful surgery there, Lord, so that he can get back onto his feet and Lord, be um, able to be back even with us here on Sunday mornings. And so Father, we just pray your, your blessing and Lord on them uh, in the morning. And Lord, we have a, a, such a list of those who are recovering from surgeries. And Father, we just continue to ask for healing for those folks. Lord, we just pray that they, again, are patient, following doctor's orders and doing what is necessary to bring proper healing uh, to, their, to their bodies. And Father, we want to lift our nation up today. Lord, we have fallen so far. And Lord, we just pray for our nation. Lord, we just pray for the people in Washington. Lord, that they would wake up and realize the foundation of this country. And once again, return to that foundation and that being the word of God. Lord, we just pray that there would be sound judgment and wisdom that would be used there in the capital of our nation. Father, we pray for the folks of Ukraine, and Lord, with this horrible, horrible invasion of Russia. Lord, we really don't see a rhyme or reason for this, and Lord, we just pray for all of the folks there in Ukraine, and especially the believers, and Lord, the outreach they can have in reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we just pray that this would come to a swift close. We know there has been much death and much damage. And Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones who are hurting. And Father, we know that nothing has happened that has caught you by surprise. For we know you're an all-knowing and an ever-present God. And Father, we just pray for these, for believers around the world. We know in, in countries even today, Christians are being martyred for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, we just uphold these folks in prayer this day. Lord, we just pray your blessing on our time uh, together uh, this morning as, uh, Lord, we come to sing, to give, to learn, all together to worship you. And Father, it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, if you look in your bulletin, it says patriotic service, baptismal service. That is not July 1st, folks. It is July 3rd. Uh, the 1st of July is a Friday. And if you show up at church on Friday, you will be very lonely. 
Right? It's the third. And then also down below the baptismal service in that announcement, that is the third uh, of July. So please uh, keep that. And also, and, and I will uh, update Pastor Dan when he gets back, I was scheduled for surgery on the 6th of July. That has now been moved to the 26th of July. And so uh, we, that's kind of have changed some plans for us and what's going on. Uh, but it is something that could not be helped, and so we have had to make those adjustments. So uh, that will be made on the prayer list, but I just wanted to make you apprised that that, that has happened. Uh, I'm just very thrilled that Roy's been able to get this knee replaced tomorrow uh, and get that taken care of. Just a few other reminders here. I see the coffee table is filling up. Uh, I think there's still a few bottles out on the table if you want to do that, but remember, they have to be in next week. We still have openings for camp if you would like to send your children, uh, but the cost is now up. You've missed that deadline, uh, so uh, the, the cost is now a little higher, and, uh, but we still have room for more kids, more boys and girls, and we also still have a need for some volunteers. Um, and, and I'll explain a little bit what's going on. We have a couple who've been coming to camp for quite a few years. A camp means a lot to this man. Uh, that's where he found the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior at Little Mahoning Bible Camp. And they've been coming for quite a few years. His wife is a nurse, and he is our archery instructor. Well, we got the bad news this year that Brother Dave is fighting colon cancer. And so he is not able to be there this year to instruct. Uh, the last I talked to Bruce, he thinks he may have an archery instructor. We still have need for a nurse. And some of you might say, well, aren't you and Eileen going to be there? Yes, we are. And when this need for a nurse came up, I said to Bruce, you know, Eileen, and he said, don't even talk about that. I need her in the kitchen. Uh, so uh, we still need, now, by the way, that healthcare worker can be an EMT, an LPN, or an RN. So if you would like to do that for that week, uh, we'd be more than happy to have you come and uh, stay down there at camp. And also, you'll notice there at the end, uh, we have, instead of VBS this year again, we're doing the five-day club, and that will take place in July. So please keep those things in your in your mind as uh, we work through this summer. Now, the next song, I'm going to let you sit, okay? But you better sing out nice and loud uh, as, we, as we sing together. We're going to be singing, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, a sinner's ears to his life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the phallus clean. He his blood avail for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of my name. 
For this last song, I'm going to ask you to sing, uh, to stand, because when we get to the last verse, uh, when we get to verse 3, children's church people, you are dismissed uh, to go downstairs. So if you would stand as we sing, heaven came down and glory filled my Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy I am tell He made all the darkness depart Heaven came down and glory filled my soul When at the cross the Savior made me whole My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born with the Spirit, with life from above, into God's family divine, justified fully through Calvary's love, Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came, took of his offer. He sang me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Why we sing verse 3, junior church people, you're dismissed to go downstairs. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe, riches eternal and blessings superb from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. You may be seated. As I was working on the sermon for today and knew that Pastor Dan would be away, I did not know what Pastor Dan was going to preach last Sunday. But you will realize as we get to the third section of our outline today, this is going to intersect very closely with what Pastor Dan preached on uh, last Sunday about our involvement with church. But what I would like to do today is take up the subject 
of one of the most attacked institutions in our country, and that's the family. The family is the very basic foundation of this nation or any nation around the world. And when the family unit crumbles and falls, so does the nation. We, we look at the seriousness of what's happening today, and I would like to look today at what we're going to call the functioning family, and we're going to be looking at various passages of Scripture as we get to different parts uh, of the outline that you have in your bulletin in front of you. But a family may be defined as a social unit bound by a legal marriage, it may or may not include children. You know, a cold definition does not express the expected and desired experiences of happy family living. For family to fulfill its true intent, it must be a unit that functions for the benefit of everyone in the family. A true functioning family will have Christ at its center and its members will form interrelationships of service to one another. You know, we read in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Luke 2 is the whole account of the birth of Christ. And when we get to the end of that chapter, the only information we have about Jesus from the time of being 12 years old in Jerusalem until he's 30 years old and, and beginning his ministry was this. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. You know, if, if a family is to function properly, it has to grow together. And we're going to look at some of these aspects this morning as we look at this. The first is the physical part of the family. A family should meet all of the physical, listen to this next word, needs of the family. Marriage should not be entered into until we know we can meet the physical needs of the family. When I counsel couples, and it's, it's amazing at times, you know, these, these young couples came in and they, they sit in my study and, and you can see the stars in their eyes. They are so much in love. And, and they get married, everything is just going to be hunky-dory. And I've conversed with Pastor Dan a lot on the subject of premarital counseling, and he and I both do the very same thing. I think many times we rain on their little rainbow of ideas of what marriage is like. You know, there is... Let's get real. And I discuss a lot of things with couples when I do premarital counseling. And one of the things that I even discuss are their finances. Now, you and I know very well, some people say, I can't afford to get married. And my question always was, is, why not? And I caution young couples against this. I said, please, as you enter into this relationship, don't look at what mom and dad have on either side of the family. Understand, it took them many years to accumulate all of that. It's not bad to do your furniture shopping at the Salvation Army thrift shop to get started. Do not live above your means. Sad to say, rarely is that followed. Because we get needs and wants mixed up very quickly. Let's talk a little bit about needs. The head of the family is responsible for seeing each member has sufficient food, clothing, and shelter. Now, Paul gave godly wisdom in this matter, and here's how seriously this is. He writes to Timothy, 
But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. The head of the household is to make sure there is provision for the family. Now, you might not be living in the most upscale neighborhood. You may not be dressed in all of the designer clothes. You know, I, have, I have to stop and inject here. Our kids were pretty young, but um, when I worked for the bakery, we bought a bakery, a baking plant in Queens, New York City. And my kids kept saying, it isn't fair, Dad. You always get up and see New York City, and we've never seen it. So beginning of December, when I knew everything would be decorated for Christmas, we took a one-day trip, and we got into New York City at about 11 o'clock in the morning. We had all day in New York City to ourselves. We went in by bus, and we were going to come home by bus. And we took them around to see a lot of the sights. And then my wife and I were a little curious, and we went into this famous store, Saks Fifth Avenue. My wife will attest to this fact, I am not lying. The more expensive the dress, the uglier those things were. <laughs> I am dead serious. We saw one garment hanging, and when we pulled it off the rack, it looked like it was made out of some woman's leftover 25 satin or some type of scarves. I mean, that's all it was. It looked like a mess of hanging rags. And this thing was 5,000 bucks. You know, I said, honey, go home and clean out your drawers. We have a gold mine. The church we went to in Williamsport, one of our ladies had a consignment shop and she sold clothing that, and, and a lot of her clients were professionals, doctors, lawyers, or the wives of, very upscale. And, and she knew what size clothes Eileen wore and different times she'd come to me and she'd say, hey, Bob, I got some neat stuff in, maybe you want to buy for Eileen. So I'd go down and look. And many times I could find beautiful, beautiful outfits for Eileen very, very cheaply. And I went in there one day, and she pulled this two-piece suit off, and she said, how about this one, Bob? And she started to laugh hysterically because she knew I was going to gag when I saw that thing. It was the ugliest black and white hound's tooth garment. By the way, the hound tooth checks were about that big. And she said to me, I know for a fact where that woman bought this, she bought it in Paris, and for these two pieces, she paid $1,200. I said, anybody that would pay that much money for that piece of clothing needs one of those long pointed hats that they'd put on your head and put you in the corner in the classroom in school. You see, we really have to differentiate between needs and wants. You know, we look around and we think we, there's so many things we have to have. No, we don't. You know, and we can get that needs category distorted very, very quickly. And we have to be so careful. We don't want to get caught up in the world's way of doing things. You know, the world wants to say, oh, you will look so good in this. You will look impressive if you drive that. Where we lived in Williamsport, we were right at the edge of an area in Williamsport that's known as Valamon Hill. Valamon Hill is completely built with mansions, and I mean mansions. And you know, I would have to drive through that on my way over to the office. And I have to be honest with you, I had been in one or two of those homes, and when I drove by them, I had one thought. How much does it cost to heat that place? You know, reality starts to hit. And we have to make sure that when we have a family that our needs are being met. Secondly, health. You know, your mental attitude has a lot to do with your physical. 
and your physical also with your mental, and you want to make sure that the needs of your family are being met. We have the responsibility for healthy habits. As moms and dads, we have responsibilities to make sure our kids get proper health care. That they're seeing their doctor regularly, they're seeing their dentist regularly. And I can't get into details, but I know my wife can tell you, and I can sure tell you some stories because of areas where we now work and where we have worked, of people that we have encountered. And I recall one, I think it was almost 10-year-old, was finally going to go to the dentist for the first time in their life. Their mouth was in horrible shape. We have to take care of the physical needs of our families. It's not always a pleasant experience when we take our kids to the doctors because we know that's the last place they want to be, and especially the dentist. But we have to do that so our children stay healthy, so we grow as a healthy family. Recreation. It's good to have family recreation. And when I say family recreation and the family doing things together, this does not mean that you have to go to Florida to visit the human trap the mouse built. That's a very expensive place. I was there once. I have no desire to go back again. Very expensive. There are a lot of things that you can do with your family, that you can do together. You know, you need to have your kids growing up knowing that mom and dad will go with them, they will have fun, rather than mom and dad have to work all the time. We need to do things together as a family to have fun together, to laugh together, to sometimes for the kids to watch mom and dad do something that's kind of goofy and they get a good laugh out of it. I know volunteering at a camp one summer for the older campers, we took them on a week-long canoe trip. And my eldest son was on that trip with us. And we were coming down through on the Juniata River. And in a short span of space, the Juniata River fell about nine feet. So the water was not exactly slow moving. And, and uh, the young, some, of the, some of the younger, the campers made it through. And, and uh, there was another gentleman and I on our canoe coming through. And we hit the top of that rapids beautifully, the way we were told to. And as we started down through, something shifted. And our canoe just did a nice 360. And he and I got very wet. And we got down below and got back in the canoe, and I looked over, and my oldest son was enjoying that. Watching Dad take an unceremoniously dip in the Juniata River. But you know, we need to make those memories with our young people. And to do it as a family. And it might be just day trips somewhere. But to have that enjoyable time out, enjoying life and experiencing those fun times together. The wise parent provides many recreational type things. Our, our kids were somewhat fortunate growing up. We lived in the Harrisburg area. And if you live in the Harrisburg area, there is a ton of stuff you can do with your kids that doesn't cost a dime. And that's what we used to do a lot of times on weekends with our kids, especially in the wintertime when it's just plain horrible outside or you have one of those rainy weekends and the kids are in the house and you're ready to crawl the walls. And so we'd say, all right, everybody in the car, you know, we're going into Strawberry Square, which was a a building they built in downtown Harrisburg that had a kid's hands-on science museum. Kids loved that. And we'd go in and we'd spend the day in there. But it was things that we could get out and we could do together. Folks, don't neglect that. And finally, and this is work. 
Parents, please give your kids a good work ethic. Let them know that things don't just get handed to them. I look around and I see a society today that thinks they're owed everything. And we need to instill, if it's simple chores around the house, it's doing things that we instill in our kids that if you really want something bad enough, be willing to work for it. Now, don't set the bar so high that they're frustrated. Don't discourage your kids. But instill in them that when they do and a job is well done, there's a reward. You know, I really appreciated before our middle son moved from the Philadelphia area up into Carlisle, we went down for a concert and our grandson was playing in. And he had been selected out of his grade to play next level up in a special group of musicians. And when they got done with the concert, the music teacher encouraged their parents to send their kids for music lessons, for classes. And she said, and let me tell you something, the kids on the stage today have earned the right to be on the stage and play. Every kid that walks into my room doesn't get to be on that platform. You earn the right to be up there. And what she was saying is, you don't get trophies for showing up. Teach your kids the value of a job well done, of doing it completely, doing it to the end. These are values that we must instill in our young people. Now let's go to the mental side of marriage. And some of you are probably sitting there already going, oh man, this is mental. And you're looking at me and you're pitying Eileen, I know. No institution affects the mentality of an individual as much as the home. One of the greatest gifts we receive from our Creator is our mind. And the home is the place where the mind is to be motivated to reach its greatest potential. Ephesians chapter 6, the first four verses, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. We need to work with our young people. Number one is attitude. A positive approach to life is always the best basis for good attitude. Mom and dad the most valuable thing you can do for your kids is show them how much you love each other. And protect that. That helps build their security and their safety. In both places I've pastored, I've been involved in school systems, and it's amazing when we encounter boys and girls and many times with behavioral problems and you sit and you talk to the counselor or to the principal and you find out what a mess the home life is. And it's projected in their behavior because there's no security there. They don't feel safe at home anymore because it's crumbling. And that's one thing that you can let your kids know Mom and dad, or dad and I are in love, and we love each other, and we're going to be together. I always liked the part when our kids got to be 8, 10, 12, and Eileen and I would embrace and kiss, and they would sit on the couch going, oh, yuck.
But they knew we loved each other. And how we treat our kids is going to do a lot to affect their mental attitude. I worked with a lady who was told as a young child that she was unexpected and unwanted. Mom got pregnant when she didn't think she could get pregnant, and she was born, and she was already told she was excess baggage. She was now in her 40s, still carrying that stigma. We have to be so careful. Instead of being one of God's unexpected little blessings, she became one of life's unexpected, unwanted problems. Folks, give your kids a sense of purpose. True purpose comes when we align ourselves with God's will. The problem is, is in schools today, we're teaching evolution, and we're teaching that, well, we're just here by chance. And if you're just here by chance, or or you're here by some fluke of nature, what value does that have on the human life? And we see that in America today with the number of babies we slaughter every year. No value in the human life. And we have to give our kids a sense of purpose. The psalmist writes in 139th Psalm, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book. They were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Let your kids know they are a creation of God. And they're here for a purpose. And that their lives have meaning and their lives have purpose. They are not some little blob of cells. That's a life that's forming. I heard one comedian speaker say after coming home from a rather strenuous couple days, he walked into the house and he said, the house looked a little unkept. And my wife, who was pregnant, was sitting on the sofa looking very disheveled and tired. And he said to her, what have you done all day? And she looked at him and she said, well, let's see. And she put her hands over her belly. Today, I made a lung and I made an intestinal tract. And he said, I grabbed a vacuum sweeper and went to work. I don't know how many of you dads had the privilege of watching your kids being born. I did. It's an amazing event. Just so you women know, I didn't forget you. I know it's a little uncomfortable for you. I'm going to run when this sermon's over. But that's an amazing event. To watch this human life be expelled from her body. And there you have this baby in your hand. And that baby is born with a purpose. And you need to instill a purpose in that child. Make sure you understand their hopes and dreams, and it's going to change over the years. It'll change over the years, but we need to encourage our young people. Oh, finances. This is a major topic in most marriages causes a lot of problems. We need to teach our kids, our young people, and and at times my wife would back me up on this with situations we encounter on a weekly basis. There are a lot of adults that we need to teach financial, fiscal responsibility. We have people today that live from day to day. 
I've gotten calls on a financial helpline. I need help with my first month's rent and my security deposit. And I say to them, oh, and what's your plan for your second month? And they go, I'll worry about that when the time comes. And I say, sorry, I don't throw that kind of money away. We need to teach our kids financial responsibility. Let them know that whenever things get short, you just can't go to a machine at the bank, put in a card, and always get cash out. Teach them that they maybe need to save for a while to get something that they really want. And by the way, when they've saved for it, they'll probably take better care of it. Teach them that responsibility. Yes, there are times when your kids might get into some type of a pinch and you may have to help them a little bit. But folks, don't keep paying your kids bills for them. Don't hand them everything. Let them understand that that's how things work. That's how it gets in real life. And we need to have financial responsibility. They're very important consideration. Make sure if you promise your children, if you do this, I will give you some, you follow through on that. Let's go to the third, fourth of these. Study. One of the first books they recommended when I went back to college in my early 40s as I trained for the pastorate, one of the first books that was recommended is, the title of the book is, How to Study. Okay, How to Study. And by the way, Google was still dead yet. We had to do things the long way. And you know, I see today that our young people have lost the value of how to really study. You ask a young person a question nowadays. Ask them a question, and it might be a hard question, and what are they going to do? Google, what is? And pff, the answer spit right at them. They haven't even had to think. Oh, by the way, the second book that they recommended that we buy when, we went, when I went back to college, and the title of the book is How to Read a Book. We need to teach our kids the value of study. And when they're doing their homework, give them a quiet place to study in the house so they're not easily distracted. Teach them how to think for themselves. You know, when I was still working in the computer industry and, and I uh, hired programmers for the company I worked for, and I, were get, I was getting young people coming straight out of college with their degrees. And I would fire a few questions at them. And they were clueless. And I sat one day with a school superintendent, and, and we were good friends. And I knew I was not going to hurt his feelings. And I said to him, help me understand something. And he said, what's that? I said, most kids now go to preschool, pre-K, kindergarten, and 12 years of school. So I said, your school system has them for anywhere from 13 to 14 years. He said, you're right. I said, they graduate from your high school, they go to college, and then they appear across my desk looking for a job, and I looked at him and I said, Bob, they're dumber than a bag of bricks. What's wrong? And he looked at me and he said, I really wish I could tell you. And I said to him, well, if it was my circus and my monkeys, and I know I'm going to have a lot of young people who are going to hate me for this, but in the school system, I would not let a kid touch a computer till seventh grade. Let them learn to use the computer the Almighty put between their ears and learn how to use it logically and learn how to use it quickly. We rely too much on being able to do this and get an answer. 
And my wife will tell you, you know, as I was studying when I was in Bible school and writing papers and, and, and even doing pulpit fill-in while I was going to school, and she would come up to the room that was now my study, and she would find books opened everywhere, and she'd say, your office is a mess. And I'd say, don't touch anything. I know it's all there. And then these packages came out for study software. And I could look at a topic for a, for a sermon, and I could key in that topic, and all of a sudden, all of these passages from these books and scripture passages would start popping up on the screen, and I said to my wife, I almost feel guilty. I feel like I'm cheating, because it would cut study time down by a lot because of what you were thinking you could readily get rather than leafing through a concordance and getting reference numbers for Greek words and, and Hebrew words and, and doing all of the cross-referencing. It's now at the fingertips. You know, I think some of our young people have lost the art of how to really study. Now, I know, I know probably within this, and I know within this congregation, we got some young people that are real whizzes. But you see, when you work as a programmer, the thing that's at the very basis of that profession is logic. And it's really tough to try to teach logic to young people, but they need to learn it. And, and I tell kids today, I said, oh, by the way, I was an accounting major in high school. I took bookkeeping and accounting. And we couldn't wait to get to our senior year because only then were we allowed to use a 10-key adding machine. Up until that time, it was all up here. You know, and kids look at me today and say, what's a 10-key adding machine? And I remember in school, that's when they first came out with the Texas Instrument Calculator Scientific. And it was only when you got to be a senior that you could use that for calculus and all of those higher forms of math and science because of all the formulas and the slide rule was slowly phasing out. Teach your kids how to study. Teach them how to think logically. Now we get to the real important part, spiritual. Deuteronomy chapter 6. The nation of Israel is getting ready to go into the promised land. They have seen God work in, in tremendous ways. And as they're getting ready to go in, Moses is now reminding them of what God has brought them through and what their responsibilities were. And here's what he writes and says to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your houses and on your gates. Notice what Moses is telling the parents. You need to instruct your kids in your home, in your daily life, and all that you do, that God's word is alive and applies to our lives all the way around. And then the psalmist reminds mom and dad, Behold, children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. The spiritual nature of a person is more important than his or her physical attributes. When life ceases, spiritual nature will continue. Proverbs 22.6 tells us, Train up a child in the way you should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Many parents have been disappointed in God and even question his word because they look at that verse and they don't study that verse. And they've mistakenly understood that that verse is a guarantee. No, it's not. Proverbs says, when you do this, 
This will be the most likely outcome. It is not a guarantee because Proverbs goes on to teach that we're going to fail. And there's going to be mistakes. But parents are responsible to start their kids on the path of righteousness. When Pastor Dan, and I think it was Mother's Day, am I correct? When we had infant dedication. And I've done quite a few of those with families in my church. And one of the things that we challenge the parents is, will you, at the first available opportunity, lead your child to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? And the parents respond, we will. That's the priority there in your kids' lives of seeing that they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's the number one here, is conversion. You see, when you start your kids off on the right path, that's inscribed in their hearts and in their minds. And maybe they will stray. But let me tell you something, folks. God said, my word will not return unto me void. Those things are going to play in their hearts and minds. And I've heard many testimonies of young people who went away to college, drifted from the Lord, or went into the military, but that haunted them the whole time, and they eventually came back to the Lord. Because of that early training, because the Scriptures being embedded into their hearts and lives. God's created an institution to help you. It's called church. Make sure your kids know the importance of being in church. Now you know how to do that. You come as a family. Let them know that it's necessary for them to be there. Bring them to Sunday school. You know, if we refer back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, the prime responsibility of teaching your children about the Lord Jesus Christ and what God expects is mom and dad. It is not the church. It is not Sunday school. They are there to aid you. They're there to come alongside of you. Organizations like Child Evangelism Fellowship exist. We call ourselves a parachurch organization. They will come alongside a church and assist them any way they can. They're coming to do a five-day club here this summer. And let me tell you, from personal experience, I can tell you that the young people who will be here doing that club will go through training here in just a couple of weeks. In fact, it starts on Saturday of this week. And they will have a week long of intense training that when they teach a Bible story, they weave into that Bible story evangelistic, winning a child to Christ, helping a kid that's already a Christian grow, and also to give an insurance to a kid that might be waffling, I'm really not sure what I understand and what I believe. You bring your children to Sunday school, and there they're instructed Bible stories and education that are on their level, and will challenge them. That is additional training to what goes on in the home. The question comes back to, though, is, is how important is church in your life? And as you were challenged last week, how involved are you in church? You know, as I said as we closed last week, we didn't hire Pastor Dan to do all the work. In fact, he can't do all the work. Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, and he gave, and he himself, this is God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Listen, for equipping the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying or maturing of the body of Christ. Yes, there is an immediate purpose for that professional office, that pastor. Okay? But his job is to get everyone else, all of us, equipped so we can do the work of ministry. 
You know, when Jesus is ascending back up into heaven, and He says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And talks about baptizing and making disciples. And I often ask people, what is, what is the verb? What is the verb command in those verses? And they say, go. And I say, uh-uh. You see, when you read that out of the Greek, what the Greek is saying, as you are going, proclaim the gospel of Christ. When that command was given by Christ, when that was given before Jesus ascended back into heaven. He was telling all of the believers, as you go into the world, you share Jesus Christ. The verb is make disciples. And that's what we're called to do. Make disciples. When someone gets saved, we don't turn them loose. We work with them. We teach them. Remember, they're just babes in the Christian life. You see, if the whole task of the church was left up just to the pastor, it would never get done. There's too, there's too few official pastors anymore. And lay people must be equipped to reach the lost and to minister to the needs of the world. Just a little reminder. How many of you watch professional sports? It might be baseball, Basketball, football, soccer, any of those sports. And I'm sure many of you watch those professional sports. Let me ask you this question. How many times have you ever heard the whistle blowed for a timeout and the coach and the manager ran out on the field to play? I can tell you how many times. Never. What's the job of the coach or the manager? To get the players geared up to play to the best of their ability. That's what pastors are called to do. This goes all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. It is the responsibility that this starts in the home. And we build that importance of being in God's house. Coming to church should not be an activity we do when there's nothing else to do on the weekend. It should be a priority. And then following along with that is consecration. Paul talks about that in Romans 12, 1 and 2. We present our bodies a living sacrifice. We're not conformed to this world, but transformed, that we may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. We need to consecrate our bodies to the Lord Jesus Christ. God, all that I am, I give to you. Lastly, quiet time. Encourage your children to do quiet time. You know, that might be times when they're going to come to you with questions. And you may have to spend a little bit of time discussing that and answering those questions. But teach them to spend time with God each day. Whether it's first thing in the morning, whether it's before they go to bed at night. Teach them that that is important to have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to know where they are and to continue to build their lives for the Lord. You see, the family is the most influential factor in the life of an individual. Christ is glorified by the actions and attitudes you find when you look at your home. Now, you heard me read out of Deuteronomy. That was Moses' command to the people. Teach your kids. Now, we move ahead in Scripture. We're into the book of Judges. Joshua has already challenged the people of Israel. And we find that in Joshua chapter 24, when he says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, will serve the Lord. That was the challenge. Now we get to Judges chapter 2. And this is what we read. When all that generation, this is Joshua's generation, had been gathered to their fathers, and not a generation arose after them who did not know the Lord 
nor work which we had done in Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And I look at it and I say, who failed? It wasn't Moses and it wasn't Joshua. It was mom and dad. They failed to teach their children and there arose a generation that knew nothing about what God had done. Folks, it's important in our homes in America today that we teach our kids there is a God and that we matter and we can be effective and we have a purpose. And that's why we're here. Father, we look at this today and Lord, we thank you for the challenge we have in your word concerning our families. And Lord, we just pray for our families. Lord, we know it's not an easy task in the society we live in today. And so, Father, we just ask that you give mom and dads the strength, that you give them the purpose, the patience, as they work with their young people and point them to you. And Lord, build in them a relationship that will last for all eternity. Father, we just pray your blessing on each one for having been here this day. In your name we pray. Amen. As I was putting the final touches to this, I saw something this week. Okay, by the way, here's that verse from Joshua. I saw something on social media this week, and you know what? It worked in so perfectly. See what it says here? You must read to your children. You must hug your children and you must love your children. Your success as a family, our success as a society depends not on what happens in the White House, but what happens inside your house. The very foundation upon which this nation is built. I'm going to ask Brother Jim if he will come and close us in prayer this morning. Brother Jim Hazlett. pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for families. And Father, we know that the family is under attack in this country. So I just pray that we would stand strong and bring our children to church each week, Father. Teach them the truth. And Father, I thank you for this time. I pray you just go with us as we go our separate ways. Watch over us. Keep us safe in thy care. Bring us back again at the appointed time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.